we will be discussing general regulations. I've got my code book ready. Do you have your code book ready? Remember, you can get a lot of understanding as we go if you will follow along and mark this as we go. We're going to talk through these code sections one by one. So let's jump into 301 in general. The provisions of this chapter are to govern the general regulations regarding installation of plumbing not specific to other chapters. Kind of a catch-all. Now check this out. 301.2 System Installation. Plumbing shall be installed with due regard to preservation of strength of structural members and prevention of damage to walls and other surfaces through fixture usage. I'm going to summarize this by saying don't be a hack. Do you know what a hack is when I say hack? What I, I mean you get your saws all in and just chopping things to pieces so your pipes can come through. Let me give you a story of a hack. I was working alongside an HVAC contractor and they were running the flue out the roof. This was in a framed house. The wood had you know sheeting OSB on the roof there and they had to go all the way about the roof with their flue. As they were trying to cut the hole for this flue, it was kind of high up in the trusses. So they got up in there and cut a hole and they were bringing the pipe up and realized, oops, they missed on the hole a little bit. So they rounded it out here and they rounded it out there. And by the time they got it done, they had a four inch pipe going through the roof and a massive one foot hole all the way around it. It was this horrible, horrible installation. You don't want to be a hack. You want to protect and preserve the structure. If we go to the finished side of things, we've got finished countertops. If you're a good plumber, you're not going to be setting tools on that. You're not going to be putting things on there that can scratch the countertops. This is what we're talking about. Prevention of damage to walls or other surfaces. We want to protect and preserve by being careful. 301.3 connections to drainage. Basically every fixture has to have a direct connection to the sanitary drainage system. They give a few exceptions and all of those exceptions fall over into chapter 13 and 14 of the International Plumbing Code, which is about gray water. So that means maybe we take the tubs, showers, lavatories, clothes washers, and we, we take some of that water to reuse it to fill our toilets or to water our plants in the yard. Those are the only exceptions. Other than that, pretty much all fixtures need to have a connection to the sanitary drainage system. In 301.4, we find a similar requirement that all the water lines have to have a connection to any of the water that they would require, so cold or hot and or hot. So if a plumbing fixture requires water, then we have to supply that. 301.5, pipe, tube, and fitting sizes have to be nominal and standard sizes. Imagine if every pipe manufacturer had their own sizing system. Oh, it would get to be such a mess out there. This is one of the few areas where it's regulated such that across the board, we can get pipe and fittings from different manufacturers and they will fit together. And that's what this nominal and standard is all about. That helps us a lot. 301.6 prohibited locations. There's some places that plumbing should not be installed. One of those is in an elevator shaft. Let's look at that. Their one exception is that they will allow for a sump pit and a sump pump so that if the hydraulics in that elevator should fail, there's a way that you can get rid of all that oil without having to swim in it. And then it would have to go through an indirect waste receptor, meaning we're going to catch that oil and separate it instead of just dump it down the regular sanitary sewer drain. Then we also have 301.7 conflicts. Anyway, that there is a conflict between this code and the manufacturer's installation instructions, which one are we going to do? It says the more restrictive provisions would apply. So they're not saying one over the other, they're just saying whichever one's the most restrictive going to cover us the best. That's the one we go with. Section 302, exclusion of materials detrimental to the sewer system. Ashes, cinders, rags, flammables, poisonous, explosive liquids, gases, oil, grease, or any other insoluble material capable of obstructing, damaging, or overloading the building drain. Did I read that dramatic enough? Shall not be deposited by any means into the system. Look, we just don't want to destroy our sewer, our public sewer system. We kind of need that thing to keep running. So anything that's going to do some mess down there, we're, we're not going to put it down. And there's ways that we can pull stuff out, separators, interceptors, traps. There's ways that we can make sure that the waste we put down the main sewer isn't going to destroy the sewer system. That's what we're talking about here. Industrial waste is similar. 
there's quite a few of these here in Cache Valley in manufacturing where they create waste from industrial processes and they have to clean it on site before that waste can be deposited into the sewer system. 303 goes over materials. There are a lot of different types of materials that we install with plumbing. Think about from the pipes that we install. We connect all the pipes together. We hook up the fixtures. There's valves. But all of these materials together have certain things in common and here they are. 303.1. They have to have identification. Meaning like they tell us the manufacturer and the markings of referenced standards so that they can prove like yeah this is a quality piece and it's approved for installation. They have to be approved for us to install them at all. And we also are required by 303.2 to follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. We need to install these things the way that they were designed to be installed. 303.3 plastic pipe fittings etc require third-party certification and that's the same as 303.4. Now what is third-party certification? That means if I own a manufacturing company and I'm producing something for plumbing then I have to pay someone to come from outside my company to look over the processes to do tests and inspections and to make sure that what I'm producing meets the standards that are required and that third party is not a part of my business they don't profit from what I do but they do have to say oh yeah what you're producing is good quality here's our stamp and then we're approved Third-party certification goes a long way to keep our plumbing materials up to a higher standard. Now, 303.5 talks about cast iron, soil pipe, and fittings. Once again, it also requires third-party certification. How about this one? 304, rodent proofing. Now, this may not be a huge problem where we live, but in many areas of the world, the sewers are rampant with rodents, and they will come up your pipes they'll swim right through the bowl of your toilet and it is a big problem so so we have some of these requirements 304.1 says we have to prevent rodents from coming into the structures 304.2 the strainer plates on drains or other openings have to have a maximum opening size of half inch no greater than that uh 304.3 meter boxes are taken out of our code some locations would have boxes where the meters are and that's a, an entry point for rodents but here in Utah we don't even have meter boxes so that's been deleted by the Utah amendments. You can put a line through yours, that's what I did, just kind of score it like you can see on the slide. Not something you need to worry about. 304.4 openings for pipes. All of the openings around pipes, let's say I bring a pipe into a building, those have to be sealed around the pipe so that rodents or other things can't get in, squeeze in through there. Now, you have to understand, rodents like mice can like basically compress their rib cage to very narrow, narrow dimensions. And they can slide right through things that you might not think they can make it through. <laughs> so, that's why we have all of these protections against rodents. I've run a service business for many years here in Cache Valley and haven't had as many problems with rodents, but I will tell you that snakes are a problem in many areas in Cache Valley. They'll come up through the plumbing, they'll find a way in, and they end up in people's homes. So this is a real thing. We try to keep all those critters out. Let's go on to 305, protection of pipes and plumbing system components. 305.1, protection against contact. To understand the first part of this, we need to know the difference between a ferrous and a non-ferrous metal. Ferrous meaning that it has iron in it, so steel, cast iron, galvanized steel, things like that, those are ferrous metals. Non-ferrous meaning it doesn't have iron in it. Copper is the main one that we deal with in plumbing. And when a non-ferrous metal comes in contact with a ferrous metal and water moves through that non-ferrous copper, then what will happen is you'll have this electrolysis happening. The electrons start to eat away at the copper. So for that reason, it says metallic piping, except for these ferrous metals, cast iron, ductile iron, and galvanized steel, shall not be placed in direct contact with steel framing members, concrete or cinder. We're just trying to protect those metals, particularly copper, from corrosion. 
It says, metal pipes shall not be placed in direct contact with corrosive soil. Again, trying to protect those, those pipes. Where sheathing is used to prevent direct contact, if we're going to install a sheath, that's like having a pipe around a pipe or wrapping it to give it some extra space so that the pipe can move, can expand and contract. Um, a lot of times if a pipe is held in place by concrete and it can't expand and contract, it'll actually tear. And I've made a lot of those repairs as a service plumber. 305.2, pipes need to be protected against stress and strain. Those stresses and strains can come in the form of weight from other things pressing on them or the weight of the pipe itself pushing down or if it's not adequately supported, you might have some of those strains. So we just wanna make sure that all of the pipe is supported and protected so that it won't be damaged. 305.3 tells us that when pipes pass through a foundation wall, they need to have an extra sleeve around them, some space. And that sleeve should be two pipe sizes larger than the pipe itself. Now that gets a little tricky if you're installing a three inch pipe and you think, okay, let's see, four inch pipe and then five inch pipe would be the next, but it's really hard to get five inch pipe. It exists, but it's hard to get and very expensive. So you'd be going to the next level, which is six inch pipe, and that leaves an enormous gap around the pipe, which is not good because groundwater can, can get in through that. Any of these pipes through a foundation, we do have to seal so that groundwater won't come into the building. So the challenge is just making sure that there's space around the pipe so that it can expand and contract, but also that it's not too much and that we can seal it. Again, the thing you'll want to remember for test question purposes is two pipe sizes larger than the diameter of the pipe passing through. Well, that is the size of the pipe sleeve. 305.4 talks about freezing or protecting pipes against freezing. So what we're looking at is we have to dig down past the frost line and code says you have to be six inches below that frost line so generally if you're about four feet deep in Cache Valley then you're going to be deep enough to avoid freezing. Now let's say you go to southern Utah, St. George or even further than that Arizona and places where you don't really get much cold weather and you don't really get much frost. Uh, in those cases the pipe should not be any less than 12 inches below the finished grade. That means the top of the ground level. So we don't want it too close to the surface is what we're talking about there. It has to be at least one foot below. Those are some important numbers that you'd want to have marked in your book and that you'd want to remember. Now what about pipes that are in walls? In general we're going to try to avoid freezing by keeping those pipes to the front, to the interior side of the wall and try to insulate behind that. That's about the best you can do. Otherwise, it's best to just avoid the exterior walls altogether if you can. Sometimes you need to run a pipe in an exterior wall, but if you don't have to, then you know you can avoid that possibility of freezing altogether. Here's the frost resistant hydrants that we use or the hose bibs, and they are designed so that you can use them through the winter but they do have to be installed with some slope. So that's one of the other things that we do so that we can protect our pipes from freezing. In 305.5, we look at the waterproofing of openings, particularly uh, pipes that would penetrate through the roof or through the exterior wall of the building. 305.6, protection against physical damage. As they're hanging sheetrock on the wall, they're going to be driving screws into the studs and those screws are long enough in many cases that they can penetrate right into our pipes. So we have to put on nail plates and that would protect the pipes from those screws coming through. The requirement for nail plates says that anytime that the hole which the pipe would pass through is one and a quarter or less from the face of that stud, then we would need to put some protection on. And there should be a two inch nail plate at the sole plate and the top plate. The sole plate is down at the bottom. So if you look in this picture, there's a normal nail plate. That's not enough. You need to have a taller one that's gonna come up two inches from the sole plate. That's the board that goes across the bottom of the wall. 
and the top plate is the one that runs across the top of the wall. In 305.7 we look at the protection of components of the plumbing system. Anytime that there's possibility of them being damaged, especially if it's in a driveway or a place like that, uh, we would need to go about some way of protecting them. Ideally, let's get our pipes in the walls, that protects them. Or you could build a protective guard of some sort or have a concrete post that's going to stop them from being damaged. An example of this might be if you have plumbing in a garage and you know that's where you park. You're going to need to make sure that there's no way you, that vehicle could accidentally be run into the plumbing appliances or systems. In 306, we are digging in the dirt. It's time to put those pipes underground. So we're trenching, excavating, and backfilling. 306.1 says that the pipe must be supported the entire length. That means we install that pipe and then we go embed that and make sure all along the way that it's properly supported so that it can maintain that slope. A lot of times when I'm installing underground pipe like this, I'll create mounds every four feet or so and kind of get my grade so that I can you know install it as I go but then I have to come back through and make sure to bed and compact all the way around that okay 306.2 trenching and bedding in 306.2 we're going to look at a few of these uh, there's over excavation rock removal and soft load bearing 306.2.1 talks about over excavation if we're digging and we go too deep then we need to refill that trench to the level where the pipe will be, but we have to fill it with something that will support. So don't just throw loose dirt in there. We need to get gravel or sand or compacted earth so that it can support the pipe there. Now when it comes to rocks, if there are rocks that would penetrate up into the pipe, that's 06.2.2, we have to remove those rocks down to three inches below, and then similar to over excavation, we refill that with something that is uniform and supportive so that it will protect the pipe and also support the pipe. Now the soft load bearing in 306.2.3, that's talking about organic soils. Say you were to dig it up and it's just real light and fluffy, not really strong enough to support pipe very well and it's possible that they could create a belly. Uh, we want to once again remove earth and refill it with something that's supportive. 306.3, .3, when it's time to backfill, the requirement is that we will fill in above the pipe 12 inches. That's gonna protect the pipe as we're compacting. And then above that, we fill it in with six inch lifts. We will compact six inches and then add another six and compact until we get to the top. It's really important that we compact this properly because if you take the entire spoil pile, that's the dirt that you excavated, and just push it all into the trench at once for a deeper trench, it's not going to compact properly and that can cause problems later with grade. 306.4 talks about tunneling. The pipe has to be protected from damage from uneven loading. So if it's coming through under a foundation, we want to make sure it's very well supported and that it would be prevented from settling or caving. All right, guys, so that does it for this presentation. We have covered International Plumbing Code Chapter 3 from Section 301 to 306. Join me next time, and we will finish the chapter from 307 to the end. We'll see you then.